All right, hang on just a second. Hello, I'm Rabbi Tobin. You're at B'nai Shalom. This is our weekly Monday class, and we're starting a focus series on Alicia Benabuya. The question is the book As a Driven Leaf by Milton Steinberg. Highly recommended reading for everybody. Is it fiction or nonfiction? It is fiction, but the characters and the plot line is, includes all of the stories in the Talmud that we know. So is the Talmud fiction or not in the telling of its stories? We're going to presume the Talmud is nonfiction, but this is an author who has then taken those plot lines and drawn around them a story. And so it's real people and real events and real lives fictionalized to, to build a larger human context to have a greater impact for the things that they really did and really believed and, and really experienced. So did Josephus say any of this? Everything that well, it says Josephus, no, that book doesn't quote Josephus. No, as a it doesn't quote Josephus. No, Josephus overlaps. Josephus isn't really worried about the mindset of the rabbis or their little interactions. He doesn't do that. Josephus talks about the wars and the economy and the politics and the rulers of the land of Israel under Rome at that time. So the fact that those rulers were executing those rabbis is true. Josephus verifies that as well. We don't need it verified. We know that it's true. Um, but so the, the, all of the backdrop, all these things that happen, happen. There's certainly, and the things for which there's no non-Jewish corroboration there's also no non-Jewish contradiction. Like, there's nothing from our stories that a scholar of Rome would go, oh my God, how can you say such a thing about Rome? Rome would never have done such a thing. Nobody makes those claims. Rome did those kinds of things, and they did them all the time. One of the problems that we and Christians get into sometimes is when we look at the late Second Temple period and we see an execution we elevate that execution to something really special, right? So for us, it's the martyrology of our rabbis and their steadfast faith, which maintains its place in the Yom Kippur service in traditional congregations to this day, right? It, for the Christians, it's their guy was crucified by Pontius Pilate for a particular transformative reason in a particular place in time it was an event unlike any that ever happened before or since right whereas if you just kind of walk down the street and look what's happening in rome they're killing people all the time it's just each person has their favorite guys on their own team who got killed and then those particular deaths are elevated to a level of meaning that is transformative and endures over time but the truth of the matter, a couple of these guys running the Roman province uh, in the late Second Temple period were really just bloody, violent, ugly people. That changes soon enough, but that's not part of this story. It has to change, otherwise the Mishnah would never get written. So the Mishnah is actually written under a time where the Roman governor is not this kind of a person. Right? Rome doesn't like the blood fest. It's not good for business. Right? So a couple of these guys, one of these guys gets promoted to emperor, right? And he comes back and, and crushes the rebellion. But then the people after that, they're looking for another way. So, you know, Rome is really meant to be about Pax Romana, not ruled by the sword. They like taxes. They like roads. They like bread and circuses. They like aqueducts. They like it to be calm and quiet by their rules. Unfortunately, they're invaders, not allowing the local population to be who they want to be, right? And that's where the conflict comes from. Okay, that's background. So, Alicia Benabuya. I have my little pet tick here, 15A. Ahir chopped down the sapling. And we did Metatron, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we have, just to, to give the quick review, Acher goes in with Rabbi Akiva. Elisha ben Abuya goes in with Akiva ben Zomai ben Azai. One dies, one's, one's mentally wounded for the rest of his life. Akiva goes in and out in peace, evidently. And Acher, Elisha ben Abuya, cuts down the saplings while he's there. 
<clears throat> one little story about that has to do with him interacting with the angel Metatron and making um, really uh, theological uh, accusations against Metatron's behavior, that Metatron's behavior indicates some form of dualism in heaven for which Metatron is punished. But at the end of the punishment, um, Alicia Benabuya is condemned to never be allowed to do tshuva again. So there's not a winner in that little scenario. And it's not exactly clear from a simple read that Alicia Benabuya has done anything wrong. Right? He sees Metatron sitting down, writing down the merits of Israel, and he says, you're not allowed to sit, you're in the presence of God, you're not allowed to turn your back, you're not allowed to be inattentive, and all this kind of stuff. Um, what, is he, what does that do? Remember, what is Metatron doing? He's recording the merits of the Jewish people. On the basis of their merits, they are not destroyed by God. It's on the basis of our mitzvahs that God maintains the world. So if Alicia Benabuya has done something that stops Metatron from doing that while he's being whipped, he's actually undermined the safety security system of the entire cosmos. So his, the question is, is he sincere in his accusations or is he mocking in his accusations? If he's mocking in his accusations, then he's already lost. He's already heretical. He's already, Right. And, he's, and, and he is the greatest threat to Jews and humanity in all of the universe, right? If that's who he is, if he's a mocker who's doing this. If he's a sincere, faithful person, horrified by Metatron's behavior, then at worst he'd be making a mistake, right? But it's condemned. Clearly he's done something horrific. So we're going to have to pursue and see what's going on, okay? Um, so we had... Uh, the heavenly voice emerged, and it said, Return, O wayward sons, except for Acher. And Acher said, Look, if I'm going to have to pay the punishment, I might as well do the crime. And he goes and he finds a prostitute, and she says, Hey, aren't you that great Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya? And he picks a radish on Shabbat and feeds it to her, and she says, You must be somebody else. And the word she uses is Acher, and that is how he becomes to be known, Acher in the literature from then on. Acher means other, the other, or as philosophers in the late 20th century say, something that is radically other, with a capital O. Okay? All right, now we go. Gemara recites the first of several incidents now involving Acher and his disciple in Torah studies, Rabbi Meir. Okay, so Rabbi Meir is um, his disciple. Um, but is he a teacher, disciple? You're going to try and figure that out as we go. All right. Sha'al acher et Rabbi Meir l'achar sheyatsa l'tarbut ra'a. Okay, does everyone see where I am? Rabbi uh, Acher once asked a question of Rabbi Meir after he had gone out to the evil culture. Does everyone know where we are? Let me find in your passages. 15A is opposite 12, the pink 12. At the top left. It top says, left, after his apostasy, Acher asked Rabbi Meir. Everyone got that in the Sonsino? Yes? You have it? Yeah, I have Okay, good. So after his apostasy, after he yatsal tarbut ra'ah, he went out to bad culture. Is that... A fair translation, apostasy? The Hebrew is he went out after tarbut ra'ah, culture, evil, mm-hmm. evil culture. What do you think of as heresy? What is heresy? Deny God. A denial of God. It can be negative and it can be positive. Negative, it's a rejection of the things that you're supposed to believe. And positive would be it's an acceptance of things you shouldn't believe. Right? If I believe, you know, in somebody else's God as God, that's heresy. Sometimes it's just a new way of looking at something and the old right. way the people follow the old way. So, so heresy sometimes is often just something too new for people to understand and it eventually gets incorporated within the religion as true belief and anybody who's ever had their books burned and then you know 
honored within a tradition like Maimonides has suffered that fate one time or another. Um, you know, Copernicus and Galileo in the Catholic Church, you know, their truth endures. Often when truth first shows up, it is labeled heresy because it contradicts accepted norms. But if it is truth, it will endure. So um, heresy is, genuine heresy is either accepting things that you're forbidden to accept or not accepting things, rejecting outwardly things that you are supposed to accept. The idea that you, ha you have a wrong opinion over the test of time isn't really heresy. It's error, right? There's a sense of deliberateness in the English word heresy. You know that you are contradicting the system that's calling you a heretic. It's not you're a revolutionary. You know you're contradicting it, right? That, that's the definition of a heretic, yes? I think it was symptomatic of a very narrow regime um, it's very, very, very rigid in its beliefs, and anything that's not part of that belief system is automatically rejected out of the rabbi is Okay. Uh, in the Hebrew, then, is different to me. I hear in the Hebrew that he went out towards evil culture. He assimilated to the, the evil Roman culture, right? So now the next question is, what is Judaism? Is Judaism a system of dogmatic creed beliefs, creedal beliefs, that you have to accept these seven or ten things and you are Jewish, and if you reject them, you can't be Jewish? Yeah. <laughs> You're singing my song. But, but I've been trained in Judaism that that's not correct, that while Judaism has beliefs and norms, and you can't call anything Jewish, Judaism is also a civilization and a people and a series of cultures and you know, and that we have, we have. This is a modern training. That's not the way it was back then. But they call what he does tarboot ra'a. Not. How does Spinoza fit into that? Spinoza would be a heretic. It was a heretic. They took him. Yes, if if your if your religious beliefs are contradictory or troublesome enough, you will get excommunicated by the normative forces of Judaism. And you don't have to go to Spinoza; you can go to hospital chaplaincy, right? Every once in a while, you'll get a messianic rabbi, you know, somebody who is of a Christian church who believes in Jesus but adopts Jewish norms. Jewish texts, Jewish holidays, and Jewish so Jewish forth, Jews. to express their Christianity, and they call themselves Messianic Jews. They're obviously Christians by definition because they believe that Jesus is Christ. That's what makes someone a Christian. So, you know, that person then walks into the hospital and says, can I have the list of Jewish patients? My name is Rabbi so-and-so. <laughs> and the hospital... Let, let's call it St. Joseph's Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Doesn't have the wherewithal to differentiate between this rabbi and that rabbi. That's not. Their job. So they hand him the Jewish list and the Messianic rabbi goes trotting along happily to all the Jewish patients in the hospital ministering to them in the name of Jesus. Right. So what does the, the organized Jewish community do? Shuts it down. Shuts it down as if our lives depended upon it. Every chaplaincy, every spiritual care center, every hospital in the, in the county, meetings, letters, assurances, these people may not use the term rabbi in your hospitals, they may not ask for Jewish lists, they are not ministering to Jews as Jewish rabbis, etc., etc., etc. It's a beautiful constitutional lawsuit waiting to happen, right? But why? Because they're heretics. They believe something that's contradictory to the essence of Judaism. God cannot be man, period. I don't care about the rest of it. Once you've got God in human form, it's heresy in Judaism. Right? So well, you don't have to go to Spinoza. We do it in our day. We just don't like to think about it that way. And, of course, within our own circles, there are places where I would receive equal treatment. Right? In the ultra-orthodox. I'm not saying where, but you don't need to limit yourself to one.
<laughs> I, I believe enough. I've said enough. I've lived enough that I think there's more than one place that would, would throw me out. <laughs> the Jews for Jesus. Well, that's what I was saying. They're Christians. Okay, so heresy is, is it the sign of an insecure, narrow-minded organization? Or is it a group that has integrity and there are limits and there are borders and you're in or you're out at some point? And people who want to play that those limits are not there are a threat to the integrity of the community. Perhaps. Could go either way. In, in Talmudic mode, he's a heretic, he's out. But the, the language is he went out to Tarbut Ra'ah which I just think is very interesting about how we view this. It was, it was how Roman he was that was the problem, right? And, and then you have to look at what he does now and say, does he reflect actual beliefs that are heretical? So we're going to look at what he does, and we're going to ask ourselves that question. Is what he says so bad? Could Judaism have lived with it? And why couldn't that Judaism live with it? Those are the questions. Okay? All right. So, Ashal, so Acher asked Rabbi Meir, who wants to read? Let's get you guys reading some of this. After his apostasy, Acher asked Rabbi Meir, who wants to go? Okay, go ahead. Um, what is the meaning of the verse, God hath made even the one as well as the other? He replied, he means that for everything that God created, he created also its counterpart. He created mountains, he created hills, he created seas, he created rivers, said Acher to him. Rabbi Akiva answered, he did not explain to us, but as follows, he created righteous and he created wicked. He created a garden of Eden, he created Tehinam. Tehinam. Everyone has two portions, one in the garden of Eden and one in Tehinam. Excuse me. The righteous man, being meritorious, takes his own portions and his fellow's portion in the Garden of Eden. The wicked man, being guilty, takes his own portion and his fellow's portion in the Hebrew. Rabbi Meshar Shea? Well, let's stop there. So let's just get this piece under our belts. So what happened? What's the question? He asked Rabbi Meir a question. It's from Kohelet chapter 7, verse 14. So I'll get that for you in a second, but what's the question? God made one as well as the other. But, but, but he, yeah, but he doesn't make it as opposites. He, he makes it as the same. Not like good and evil, but mountains and hills. Okay, so the, the original hills. source is this. On a day of good, be among the good, and on a day of adversity, ponder. God has made one corresponding to the other to the end that man will find nothing after him. That's the verse from Kohelet. So on a good day, be good, and on a bad day, think about it. God has made one at Zet Leumat Zet Asa Elohim. He made this for this, this on this, this on the basis of that. Leumat Zet. It's kind of a hard Hebrew word to translate. Made this for the purpose of that or to that end. Okay. Gam et Zet Leumat Zet Asa. So he made two things. What are the two things he made? In the verse? One as well as the other. Okay. In verse 14, it says, on a day of good, be good, and on a day of evil, think. God has made one as much as the other. He's made the two days. We knew God made days. That's not a chiddush. That wouldn't get anybody mad. It's the quality of the days. What are the two things God has made in that verse? Good and evil. Good and evil. Good and evil. Okay? Remember, what did Akiva warn them not to do in the Gan? when they went into their pardes. Don't say, water. Don't say water, water. Don't say water twice, right? And what was Elisha ben Abuya's accusation against Metatron? If, if you have your back faced to God in this place, you may think that there is more than one power, that you can face something other than God means there is something other than God. Dual, dualism is the word. So Akiva warns them against a dualism. 
Acher accuses Metatron of a dualism. Acher here asks Rabbi Meir, hey, what's that verse where God makes good and evil? There's a pattern here. Okay? This is what he's on about. So what's Meir's answer? Whatever the Holy One, blessed be he created, he always created something corresponding to it, right? Mountains, hills, seas, rivers. Ah, so it's a big and a bigger. Big and bigger, big and bigger. Those are quantitative differences between things of the same character. Yeah, because a mountain, the opposite would be a valley. Correct. Right. So right. Rabbi Mayer's answer is not convincing. Unfortunate. Amarlo, says Acher, he said to him, that's now what Rabbi Akiva, your teacher, said, Ella barat sadikim barabashayim, that he taught, that he created good people and bad people. Barat gan Eden, barat gehenom. He created a garden of Eden. He created the pit of darkness and death. Kol echad ve'echad yesh lo shnei chalakim. Okay, so the answer might be each and every person has two portions. Echad began Eden ve'echad began Everybody has two portions. Everyone's got a Garden of Eden portion and a Gehenom portion. Zachat Sadiq, what the Tzadik merits, Natal Chalko v'chelek chavero began Eden. He takes his portion and his peer's portion in the Garden of Eden. Nit chayev rasha. A wicked person becomes guilt. Natal chelko v'chelik chavero begeno. So, what does that mean? What's this last piece? A tzaddik and a rasha each earn their portion of Gan Eden or Geheno. And I hate to say it, but the best translations here are probably heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. Not really what we spend a lot of time doing in Judaism, but in this passage, this is heaven and hell. A good place and a bad place after you die. The righteous person, everyone has a piece of heaven and a piece of hell destined in their soul. If you are a tzaddik and you live a righteous life, your piece of bad will get owned by a bad person so that they, they become entirely bad and go down to Gehenna. And their piece of good, you get. So you become entirely good and go to Gan Eden, go to paradise. So if you're 60-40 good, your 40 goes off to the poor guy who is 60-40 bad, and everybody is 100% one or 100% the other after they die. That seems unfair. Yes. Uh, also unlikely. Well... <laughs> unless it's true <laughs> right the problem with theories of the afterlife is we can like talk about them all we want eventually we'll know and evidently there's no you know communication back all right so is that a good answer or a bad answer <clears throat> remember what is rabbi Mayer trying to answer what did Acher pose as a problem God created evil as a thing. Therefore, there is dualism in the cosmos. There's a duality in the cosmos. And the answer is, there's no, everything's paired up. There's two of everything anyways, right? But that doesn't really work. So the second answer is, what about good and bad? People. He says, your teacher, Rabbi Kiva, said God creates good people and bad people. The answer to that is not really. People can be mostly good or mostly bad, but what he's saying is, after they die, they're all one or the other, as far as their destiny. Does that solve the problem of dualism? I think it actually exaggerates the problem, because now, for all eternity, you have these two different places, a place of good and a place of evil. Unless you can define genom as something else. All right, next reader. Somebody else? In what does it say in the Hebrew, in the English translation that I'm following, it says, he created righteous and created wicked. People. It doesn't, it doesn't say people. Those are people, though. The Hebrew word is tzaddikim, which is always people. 
Other words, it would be tzedakim. That's, that's not a good translation. Because he created righteous and created wicked is he created good and he created bad. Mm-hmm. Right? You're saying it's he created good people and bad people in the Hebrew. Yeah, Rabbi Akiva, Ella Barat Sadikim Barat Rashaim. Those are people. Those are people. Yeah, okay. Always people. Well, this is a British translation. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the Sanzino. The, the British translation is trying to be genteel, and it winds up being a little Gentile. <laughs> what can you do? It's, it tries to smooth things over. The, 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 the early British translations really do try and smooth over potentially embarrassing places where the non-Jewish reader or the not fully learned Talmud scholar might get tripped up by things. It, it, it's a fairly smooth road to read. Uh, all right, Gemara. Rav, now we're going to do, this is Rav Misharshia. Okay. Rav Meshashia said, what is the biblical proof for this? In the case of the righteous, it is written, therefore in their land they shall possess double. In the case of the wicked, it is written, and destroy them with double destruction. Nice proof texts. Yeah. I like these. All right, so he goes and he pulls out off the shelf Isaiah and Jeremiah and their prognostications about what's going to happen to good and bad people. And in typical hermeneutical style, the prophets say things like, you will get double what you deserve, right? And that's a fairly common kind of way to talk. So we do have verses that say, the righteous will get double, the evil will get double, and he finds two of them. But doesn't that negate the free will? Unless you choose, well, if you were created as Sadiqim, which is what the quote seems to say, that your teacher Rabbi Akiva says, Barat Sadiqim Bara Rishaim. He created Sadiqim and he created Rishaim. That would seem to say that there's a predestination that these people are good or evil from the time they are created. And the answer to that seems to be. Um, in the context of the sweep of all of our tradition, no, people have choices. They become more or less of one of these others. The, the first answer is that you have a piece of this and a piece of that in you. Everyone has tzaddikim, rishayim, things in them, and our job is obviously to become only the tzaddikim. That's our job, right? But it, yes, it's messy. Yes, yes. You have to go against the concept of the shuba. So with genuine shuva, you have the ability to offset most of the things that Rishayim do, right? Not all of them, but most of them. So the I, so I'm not saying, I don't think that this eliminates the possibility of shuva because they are talking about at the time you die. So what you do up until that point, you have lots of choices. It's like Rambam. Rambam says that you should do to shuva the day before you die. Well, how do you know? <laughs> and nobody knows when you're going to die, so you should be doing shuva all the time, just in case you forget to look before stepping off the curb. Right. Okay. Yep. I think about it not in, in terms of, of predestination, but more logical consequences, like the phrase we have: "Leap what you shall sow." That kind right. of idea. Right? You become yeah. what you eat. Exactly. That's morally as well as physically. Right. If you take in evil influences constantly throughout your life, no matter how much you think, I'm a good person, at the end of the day, you're defined by everything you've taken in, right? This is the person you are. Maybe that's why they call it Tarbutra, that he went out to evil culture, because culture is kind of the enveloping life in which you live, right? It's assuming that the world is a dangerous world. Well, look what's happening. What what is what is Acher doing in this paragraph? I think he's justifying himself. At, at, at the much more simple level, at the first most obvious simple level, what activity is he engaged in? He's consorting with people from the wrong side of the tracks. That was back with the hooker. Right. right. After that. I mean, Meir is not on the wrong side of the track. If I'm going to be in Russia, I'm going to be in Russia all the way. In other words, I did something wrong. Okay, you're, you're drawing conclusions. I want back it up. Well, I mean, he's challenging the rabbi. Back it up. Back it much more general. From 30,000 feet, you, you fly over this thing, you look down, and you see two people. What are they doing? 
About what? Good and evil. Based on what? What they do or what, or what culture they're... What they're are they from. doing? Based on a verse. Yes. What are they discussing? The definition of, of good and evil in the Torah. Torah. They're studying Torah. What is Rev? What is Acher doing? Acher is studying Torah. So Not only is he studying Torah, he's asking a rabbi a question, right? So you got to understand here. We know because we're reading this, and he's called Acher that he's got to be bad. What he's doing is bad, right? But what is he doing? Where's the Tarbut Ra'ah? What evil culture is he a part of? He's still hanging out with the Yidden. <laughs> well, what about the prostitute? Maybe she was too, but I don't know. <laughs> okay? But in this paragraph, in this paragraph, what's he doing wrong? He's studying Torah. So we have to assume that the way he's doing it or what he's asking, that there's some insipid motive involved, and there may very well be because he's accentuating a question about dualism. He may be challenging Rabbi Meir and saying, sure, you think God is one, so how do you interpret the verse, he made this and this, right? And then the Gemara runs off into this thing where we wind up with Gan Eden and Gehenno, and Sadiqim and Rishaim, which doesn't seem to be part of Rav Meir's answer to, Rav, to Acher at all, it's Rav Misharshia and the others. It's this other level of interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have a question. Is, but what is considered good and evil? The Ten Commandments? The rule? For the rabbis, good is belief in God, study of Torah, and doing of the mitzvot. All of them. Evil is not believing in, they, yes, 613. The, although in the Mishnah, they never say 613. That's a Talmud word. Um, so not believing in God, rejecting the Torah, refusing to do the mitzvot are evil, and doing those things are good at the simplest level for the Jew. For the non-Jew, it would be hating us, killing us, stopping us from doing those things. That's evil. Loving us, supporting us, helping us to do those things would be good. So everybody in the world would be judged good or evil based on whether or not Jews those are able standards. to. I mean, those are just standards. It's not like you go up, you write on Shabbos in the car. Are you considered? Uh, in the Talmudic, well, you know what? Hold on, because Fran asked, you know, so if you ride in a car on Shabbat, are you evil? Right? That's a loaded question because oh, different. Different movements have dealt with that in different ways, and you always have the context. What if the person can't walk? You know, you've got all kinds of stuff that people could start to talk about. We will have their version of that case in these pages where they're riding on a horse in Shabbat. Okay, so we're going to see that. There's going to be a horse involved here at some point, which is their car. The horseless wagon is that was referred to. My question is, uh, Amara says in translation after his apostasy, yes. Asher asked Rav Meir a question, saying to him, said, what is the meaning of the verse? What was his intent? What was Asher's intent? So the, if his intent was to question, you know, come on, from God, give me a break. So, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> so part of the problem here is, who put the words... In the Talmud, do we have a tradition that Acher asked Rabbi Amir this question, and that was the original tradition? Because if so, what's the problem? A colleague asks a colleague a question about a verse happens all the time. So it is. We have this preliminary contextual statement. After he was a heretic, he asked this question. Well, now that we know he's treif. His question must be treif, right? Because he's treif. And what's going to, what, why I love these passages is it's going to turn on, an, on, an, on a question that I think we all have to answer for ourselves. And that is, is a, is a not kosher 
person, lifestyle, whatever, able to have, <clears throat> represent, teach, and convey kosher Torah? Can a treif person teach kosher Torah? Right? So he's already become a heretic. Does that make him incapable of engaging in genuine Torah study? Does that make him untrustworthy in conveying genuine Torah teachings? That's a, and that's the kind of question that the divide in our modern community is based upon. Why can't so-and-so walk into such-and-such -such a synagogue? Why can't such-and-such -such a rabbi be called rabbi in such-and-such -such a place? Why can't you do those things? Because the conservative rabbi might stand up and teach perfect Torah, right? Or write a book that is perfect Torah. They are not going to be allowed to speak in a certain place. They are not going to get their books published or sold in a certain place, right? Because they are treif. So their that's Torah correct. can't be kosher. That's correct. You think the Stavora was thinking with that? I think that's a question that I want you to look at as we look at these cases. Because if that's the concern, all of these things make sense together. And if that's not the concern, then these are all isolated stories. So most of this comes from rabbinic law. Everything comes from rabbinic law. I'm That's the funnel which back. Torah came through, right? I'm going back to just the basics. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Karaites tried that, and it didn't work too well for them either. Yeah. So is this sort, sort of a way of guarding against the danger of the evil son who would talk about the Seder? Hmm. The, the, the what does this mean to you? Yeah, exactly. The he would not have been redeemed because he set himself apart from the community. Right. Is, is this background? Perhaps, but how did he get to be Acher? Did he set himself apart, or did they push him out? Did God push him out? The Bat Kol said he can never do tshuva, and he said, fine, so I'll go find a prostitute. Who, who started this fight? Don't know. He did, because he did something that God said, you can't do tshuva, because God's not capricious in me. <laughs> right? And we don't have a capricious God who starts fights without a reason. All right, let's move on because we're, we're not making too much progress. So now, next question. We're going to Rabbi Meir again. New reader. Acher asked Rabbi Meir. Sha'al acher et Rabbi Meir le'achar she'yat sa'ala terbut ra'ah. Another question of Meir also prefaced by after he was a heretic. Go on. Golden glass. Oh, okay. After his apostasy, Acher asked uh, Rabbi Meir, what is the meaning of the verse, golden glass cannot equal it, neither shall the exchange thereof be vessels of fine gold? He answered, these are the words of the Torah, which are hard to acquire like vessels of fine gold, but are easily destroyed like vessels of glass. Said Acher to him, uh, Rabbi Akiva, thy master did not explain thus, but as follows. Just as vessels of gold and vessels of glass, though they be broken, have a remedy, even so a scholar, though he has sinned, has a remedy. Thereupon uh, Rabbi Meir said to him, Then thou to repent, replied, I have already heard from behind the veil, return ye but backsliding children, except that <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so now we've got another <clears throat> heretical Elisha, asked Meir. Uh, what's the meaning of the of the verse? And the verse is from Job, and Job is questioning where can wisdom be found in this portion of his book. And for the rabbis, wisdom always means Torah. Okay? So Job asks, where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No, no mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me. The sea says it's not in me. It cannot be bought with finest gold, nor its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with gold of Ophir, the precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor glass can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold, etc., etc., etc. So you can't buy wisdom. And the deep in the sea says, it's not in me. So where do you find wisdom? And in the end uh, of the section, um, 
It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed from even the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to which he alone knows where it dwells, for he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the winds, etc., etc., etc. This is one of Job's less optimistic moments, right? So he says, he says wisdom cannot be found anywhere. And Job says that to his erstwhile friends, who are coming and telling him, because you are suffering, you must have done evil, and you should repent of your evil, and God will will fix you and make you better. And Job says, you know, wisdom, you think you're speaking wisdom. There is no wisdom in the world. It can't be found anywhere. It can't be bought. It's not in the seas. It's not in the ocean. Only God knows where it is, and, and God basically doesn't show it to us. Does Elisha ben Abuya know that that's the larger context of his quote? Of course he does. He's a Talmud Chachim before he went out. He's a learned Torah scholar. So he knows that this is a verse that denies wisdom. And again, for the rabbis, what is wisdom? Torah. Torah. So it's a verse that denies the existence of Torah in this world. That's an interesting thing for him to raise. So he says, what does this mean? He says that to Meir. So the first question was, what does it mean he creates good and evil? Second one is, what does it mean that there's no Torah in the world? Right? So these are nudnik questions when you start to put them together. You know what a nudnik question is? You know what a nudnik is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was thinking he's like a, an attorney. He knows before he asks what the answer is going to be. Oh, you think these are all rhetorical questions? Yeah. yeah. If you make them rhetorical questions, it's a form of mocking. And we said if he's mocking, then he's evil. Because the worst thing you can do is disparage the Torah, right? To mock it, to make fun of it, to use it for sport. Okay, this refers to matters of Torah that are as difficult to acquire as gold and fine gold vessels, but are as easy to lose as glass vessels. So Mayer says, it's not that there's no Torah in the world. It's that some things in Torah are, are so hard to learn, it's like, how hard it is to acquire gold. And some of them are so easy to forget, it's, it's like trying to, to see something in glass. It, it's elusive. It's elusive. You can, you can grasp it with difficulty and lose it with ease. That's Mayer's answer. It's a pretty good answer. Acher says, Rabbi Akiva, so now he's going to bring in the big gun again. And he's going to say, Rabbi Akiva, your teacher said, Elamakli zahav uchli zechuchit af alpi shenish beru yesh lahem takana. Rather, just as there is a way to fix gold and glass that are broken, af tamid chacham, so too a Torah scholar, af alpi she sarach yesh lo takana. Even though he's soured, he's spoiled, he became rotten. He can still be fixed, Ron, through what avenue? <laughs> through tshuva. Amar lo, Rabbi Meir said, Afata chazor b'cha, so too, return to your earlier devotion, the passion in Rabbi Meir. So, so fine, so come back. Kavar shamati me'achorei hapargor, but Acher says, no, 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 I was there. I was there when the Bakol said, everybody but Acher back on the bus. Right? right? So he's, he says, I'm, I'm hopelessly beyond, lost. He's beyond Listen to the poignancy, though. I would accept that God won't take me back. Right? So you have this poignancy. Meir wants him back. And Alicia says, it's too late for me. Right? It's such a beautiful, this is why people want to write fiction about it, because there's more to be said. Okay, uh, another, Tanu Rabbanan. Now, this one does not come with the prelude. So now I'm on 15A at the bottom, Tanu Rabbanan. So if you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, lines from the two. bottom, eight lines from the bottom of the widest lines of the Hebrew, the third word from the end of the line. Taf Resh Maase Beacher. That's Tanu Rabbanan Maase Beacher. Gotcha? Yep. So this is a Baraita. We don't know. The first two stories are like 
stories from the Gemara. But remember, what's a Baraita? A Mishnah age teaching that didn't make it into the Mishnah. So it has more authority. It's older. It's from. It's contemporary to the guys in the Mishnah. So our rabbis taught in a Baraita, Maase Be'acher. There was this thing that happened with Acher. Who wants to read? A rabbi stopped. Once Acher was riding on a horse on the Shabbat. Who asked about driving on Shabbos? <laughs> this is the case. And rabbi, rabbi Meir was walking behind him to learn Torah at his mouth. From his mouth, me peef. While he's on the horse. So Rabbi, so so Acher, after he's gone to Tarbut Ra'ah, is riding his horse down the street on Shabbat. Okay, he didn't put on sunglasses and a hat and put the 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 sun visors down and around in his car and slink down under the steering wheel <laughs> and take back roads out of town. He got in the convertible and turned up the music. And everyone can see him. And he went down the middle of the, of the neighborhood. All right? So that's who he is. He's, he's riding a horse on Shabbat. Now, where's Rabbi Meir? Behind him. Walking. Walking behind him to? Learn Torah. To learn Torah from him. Can a treif person teach kosher Torah? That's why I think that this is the interpretive lens that we need to use for all of this stuff. And that's the question. And I do think that that's where the modern world has gone horribly wrong. Because Ezu Chacham, who's a wise person in Perkei Avot, that's the Gibor. The Gibor can, can conquer his evil inclination. Hmm? The one who learns from everyone. Hello, men, Nikola Adam. The Chacham is the one who learns from everyone. Right? So that's, that's what's in play here. So he's riding a horse, and Rebbe Meir is learning Torah from him. Amarlo! Acher turns around in the saddle and says to him, go ahead. So, uh, Meir, turn, turn. Meir, Meir, turn back, for I have already measured by the paces of my horse that thus far extends the Shabbat limit. Okay, so now you need to know Shabbos Halacha. If you study Masachet Erevim, you'll know that there's two ways to have an Eruv, where you're allowed to travel to a certain distance on Shabbat, and you're allowed to carry objects outdoors a certain distance on Shabbat. Roughly said, the two, well, there's three ways to do it. One is to encircle an area with a wall, even if it's symbolic, but real, like a telephone line or a fishing line or whatever. You can, there's a way to do it so that everything is inside an actual physical circle, and that's an A-roof. Second way to do it is by looking at the construction of buildings and their courtyards and finding common areas that are not really public areas, and people can move through those common outdoor areas, like the Shuk and Carmiel and stuff like that. So the next would be um, just open air. And if you have established a Shabbat place for your meals and put food there and said the bracha and indicated from here, 2,000 cubits in each direction from this spot is my Shabbat tchum, my Shabbat area, you can carry within that area. So what's happened here is that Rabbi Meir is following Alicia ben Abuya, who's walking away from wherever Rabbi Meir had established his tchum. And they get to the 2,000 cubits, and Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya, Acher, who's Torah learned and knows the halacha, and is concerned for Rabbi Meir not breaking Shabbos while learning Torah from him, says, you got to stop here. This is the Tehum. This is as far as you can go on Shabbat. I'm going to keep going because I don't give a damn. But I figured you'd want to know. Now, what's interesting is that in the Hebrew, he uses the exact same language that Meir used in the last teaching. Chazor. Return. Right? So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an echo of each other's concern for each other. Meir says, Chazor l'cha. Return back to your Torah study. And he says, oh, I can't because it's too late for me. Here, Acher says, Chazor. Return. You as well. Return to Shabbos, to, to not break Shabbos by following me. All right, and what's the reply, Amarlo? Uh, you too go back. You too. Uh, have I not already told you that I have already heard 
<laughs> behind the veil. Yeah. You turn the backsliding children. Except for her. Right. So he, he again quotes, he quotes that the bot call had said, everyone can return except me. There's no point in me getting down off the horse. There's nothing to be gained by me observing another mitzvah for the rest of my life. Right? Takifu Aile, Leve Midrasha, which is interesting because you've got Aramaic in a Baraita, which is not normal. A Baraita is normally Hebrew, right? But this is Aramaic. So he grabbed him and thrust him into the schoolhouse, the Beit Midrash, the Bey Midrasha. Go ahead. Grabbed him off the horse and pushed him into the Beit Midrash, which happened to be right there at the edge of the Shabbat border, evidently. Uh, said to a child, Recite for me um, your verse. The child answered, uh, answered, uh, There is no peace, said the Lord unto the wicked. He then took uh, him to another school. Okay, hang on. Let's see what happened in that moment. So this is a form of divination. Okay? Divination is where you set a system up that you don't have control over and you know, like you're going to flip through a deck of cards and you're going to, and the first card you pull tells you which book of the Torah to read. And the second card you pull says which chapter in the book. And the third card you pull says which verse. And you go to that book, chapter, and verse, and you read it, and it will have the answer to your trouble. It's a form of divination. Very common in the ancient world to set a system up like this where you're going to get a seemingly random Torah verse and it's going to be the answer to your question. What is Aher's question? Am I kosher? Can I do tshuva? That's the question driving the pathos of the story. He asks the random kid who's studying a random haftarah, what verse are you studying right now? And the verse is, there's no peace for the wicked. Question, answer. <laughs> right? Mayor's not happy with that answer, so what does he do? Achrita. <laughs> Takes him to a Beit Knesset. Not a Beit Midrash, but a Beit Knesset, a Knishta this time. Amar Leila Nuki, the same thing. He says to a boy, what does he say? For though thou wash thee with nitre. And thank thee much so. Yet, thine Iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord. <laughs> Even if you were to scrub yourself with chemicals down to the bone, you could not be clean of your sin before me, says God. Just a random verse from a random kid. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> let's let's keep going because the bright it goes on. Yes. In vain uh, does thou wake thyself fair, etc. Okay. So the boy finds a lovely little verse from Jeremiah, chapter 4, which basically says you can't put lipstick on the pig. Right? You can dress yourself up in a beautiful red dress and wear gold jewelry and paint your eyes and make yourself beautiful in vain, and yet you are still what you are. Right? Okay. I lay levei kanish Go ahead. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. These, by the way, are synagogues now. Kanishtas. 
The first one was a Beit Midrash, and the rest, the rest are Kanishtas. They don't differentiate. Yeah, I, I see that. I see that. Uh, and he took him to 13 schools, all of them quoted in similar vein. Thank God for saving us the other 11. <laughs> <laughs> so when he, he said to, uh, to the last one, he said, from your verse, and he answered, but unto the wicked God said, what hast what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, etc.? Okay, hang on. This is a different verse. So this verse quotes from Psalms fifty sixteen. It says, "Ulerasha Amar Elohim," and to the evil one, God has said, "Malecha lesaper chukai." On what basis can you tell my laws? What is the answer? Well, it's rhetorical. It's a Russia being told. On what basis do you think you get to quote my laws? What's the context of the sentence? Okay, you want me to go get that? That's fine. Psalms 50, 16 is probably another wisdom psalm. Psalm 50, 16. And the verses, dun, dun, dun. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth, seeing that you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? So he's saying that uh, wicked people shouldn't teach trouble. Yeah, he says, you give your mouth to evil, your tongue frames deceit, you sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son, these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes, and now it's either, let consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so the kicker is not just... You know the the evil will evil people will have no rest or whatever. It's an actual statement that you you Russia you may not speak my words, you may not speak my covenant, you may not teach my Torah. What right do you have to think that you get to talk? Right, that is harsh. Okay, so now what about this kid though? There's something different about this kid. How you knew Kihava? This particular boy was, yeah, he didn't talk so clearly, unfortunately. And so, so it sounded as though he answered, but to Elijah, God said. Mm -hmm. Some say that then Acha had a knife with him. Okay, hang on. So the kids got a speech impediment and... And it was heard, misunderstood, that instead of saying Ularisha, he said Ulish. <laughs> so instead of to the evil one, it was to Elisha. Ularisha, Elisha. So there's a speech impediment that he's not understood, and he's understood as misquoting the verse to specifically damn Elisha Benabuya by name with the words of the psalm. Okay. Ikadamre, and there's a dispute. Okay, so he had a knife with him, he cut him up and sent him to all the different schools. Okay, so one view is that Alicia Ben Abuya had a knife, and he cut the kid into 13 pieces and sent one chunk to each of the 13 schools where children had condemned him. You didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> <laughs> this is all in Shabbat, right? Yeah. All right, so he's got a knife, he's riding a horse, he's but studying a lot of Torah. And there are 13 synagogues, 12 synagogues in a school within the 2,000 cubits. Okay. The, and the others, the Ikadamre, and there's others who know the end of this story as Amar. No, before that. We didn't get to the end. There's a some say and some say. Oh, some say he said, had I a knife in my hand, I would have cut him up. Okay. That's All right. So there's two. So if I had a knife, I'd chop you into a th you know thirteen yeah. pieces and send you around the town. Um, okay. New. No, we're going to stop there. We're going to get more of these lovely stories of Acher moving forward. But you see what I'm saying? That that it seems the hinge Acher seems to have a theological question that on its face value is a legitimate question. Is there dualism in the world? 
Is there good and evil in the world? Is God in charge of, of all this stuff? Right? And he's pushing, he pushes that theological statement. And now we have this repeated way of testing and proving that God has condemned him, condemned him, condemned him. And for the first, and we have the, the, the pathos of affection between Mayer and Alicia Benabuya, which is clear. But on the end of this story, we have him acting out or threatening to act out. And at the end of the other story, we had him act out. Right? So the ends of the story always are that Alicia Benabuya doesn't do tshuva. What I would like to know is what would have happened had he done tshuva, right? He accepts the condemnation and never challenges that faith. But how can you challenge the faith when it comes directly from God, right? So these are the things upon which the story hangs. We're going to come back next week, and we're going to do it again. Okay?